Good afternoon. My name is Pastor Frank Morris. Um, I'm a resident of Monmouth, about 30 years. Um, before we even start, there's a little bit of anxiety, so we're going to say a moment of prayer. Father God, thank you that each and every individual that's here today wants their heart changed, wants their heart activated, and we have people here that are willing to speak to the issues, to the struggles that are going on. We are not separate from one another, but rather we are joined one to another. We are each responsible for our brother and our sister. So today, let's celebrate that, let's find out how, and let's put into action the love and the hope that we have for one another in one another. In Christ's name, amen. Um, a quick story about me. Uh, I was born a long time ago, I'm an old man, um, and I came to this town uh, with my wife, uh, she works at Western Oregon University. Within my time here, I have found out that I am the only black pastor here. I am one of a very few population. One year we moved from Independence to Monmouth and it changed the percentage by 3% of how many people lived in each town. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, I have been rescued by a Monmouth police officer when I was going to get mugged in a store situation working at Circle K. I have faced the N-word. I have been bothered by uh, conversations at Bible studies because this behavior that we have accepted over time exists even within the churches. Um, my role, my purpose is to go after it. I'm the guy that reaches down, pulls up the plant, the weed from the roots, and I will not give it a break. Um, and I kind of like it. Uh, here today, why are we here? Some of us don't know exactly how far to take it. Um, and I was going to save this for the end. I'm going to save it now. Do not watch the Super Bowl. You want to start somewhere, don't watch the Super Bowl. There are women who will get beat Super Bowl Sunday just because their husband or boyfriend's team is losing. There are women who have been raped, beaten up on elevators, underage women who have been tormented by the things that happen within and around the NFL. There is an NFL owner videotaped buying prostitution. And his punishment was to pay $10,000 and go back home. There is currently a lawsuit against the NFL against hiring practices. And it's a real lawsuit because there's a real situation. If you want to start somewhere, don't watch Super Bowl Sunday. There's a little woman, and we celebrate her birthday yesterday, 109 years old, little woman, by herself at the end of a hard day working. And she got on a city bus and she was tired and had had enough. And in that moment, someone said, move to the back. No, I'm done. I quit. Move to the back or we'll beat you. Move to the back or we'll throw you off. Move to the, no, I'm done. And Rosa Parks became a hero on that day. Another example, and it hurts, I had this shirt printed up because Kaepernick's knee didn't kill. Kaepernick was only on his knee for two and a half minutes, yet he was so ostracized by this country through magazines, newspapers, and a politician, a president, a president. Yet when a police officer did it for nine and a half minutes, I never heard the president say anything. We live in a society where our balance is so far off Things are so disorganized, so, so out of order, that we, us, need to do something. We can't fix the big picture. We will, but we can't today. So for now, don't watch the Super Bowl. For now, when you see a sign for a black business, go there. For now, when you see a black person walking down the street by themselves and they're doing the double head, so walk with them. Let us join and be with each other. Um, long time, well, 
Two years ago, I spoke down at Independence, and my comment was, on the side of the police car, it says, to serve and protect. Let's do that for each other. Let's serve and protect one another. So now, land acknowledgement. Monmouth, Oregon is located on the traditional head homelands of the Lucky Mute Band of Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to the reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederate tribes of Grand Ronde community of Oregon and the Confederate tribes of the Siletz Indians. I, one more thing, I just, when the, uh, how do we uh, give freedoms to blacks? How can we help black business owners and everything else? Here's an idea. When they came to settle Oregon, they told the railroads, you make a railroad and every 10 acres, you get to own it. Dare you. I dare you to do that for some black folks. Or the other thing, move into the Willamette Valley, and if you're a man, you get 140 acres. And if you're married, you get 280 acres. Dare you. I dare you to offer that to a black person. They will create a business that you will never, they will never be ashamed of, and we, the community, will never be ashamed of. The folks that we've kicked out of here, let's bring them back in. Let's bring everybody back in. In making everybody successful, we become the successful ones. Next. So we now have Harmony Thompson and Kayeke Amareas Gonzalez Perez will play the uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing, the Black National Anthem, so if everybody could please rise. I've actually just met the um, acting president of WU, Dr. Jay Kenton, um, but I've, he talks to my wife. Uh, my wife's uh, part of the university system and everything else, and, and they have these conversations ongoing and everything else, so I kind of know a little bit more about him than, than I should, so I'm not going to tell you. Um, <laughs> This is a man who, if you're an interim anything, it means that you're not here forever, so some of the decisions that you make may not last for a while. What he's doing right now is brave. The university right now is in a situation where things are changing. Things are not going to be the same as they were, and we're in the process of changing everything. In the midst of changing everything, he's got to take a stand where things are today. How do we operate today? That's hard to do. So 
in having him come forward and having him speak to you, understand that this is a man who's also in transition. This is a man who's working at a job that it doesn't have a great guarantee and it, it doesn't last. It's an interim position. So, doctor, would you join us and share your words? Thank you, Pastor Morris, and welcome to Western Oregon University. I want to thank you for joining us today for this Black History Month celebration. I'd like to thank the Monmouth City Council, Mayor Cease Kuntz, and many others for sponsoring this event today. I'd also like to thank our invited speakers, who I look forward to hearing from shortly. I am thrilled that we can come together to honor black Americans in our state. As I work to prepare my remarks today, I did research on the history of black people in Oregon. I'm embarrassed and ashamed of our state's history. Oregon was America's first and only state to begin as a whites-only state. When Oregon entered the Union in 1859, it did so as a white-only state. The original state constitution banned slavery, but also excluded non-whites from living here. And perhaps the most troubling of all, this language was not removed from our state's constitution until 2001 a short 21 years ago. I had no idea this was the case. Shame on us. We wouldn't be here today if it were not for Carter G. Woodson, who laid the foundation for African American History Month in 1926. At the time, Mr. Woodson dedicated the second week of February for the achievements of black Americans. He did this because they were all but erased from national history and underrepresented in important policy decisions. His goal was to add to the history of black Americans to school curricula and encourage people of African descent and all others to honor the accomplishments of black people. He also believed that education and fostering more opportunities for blacks and whites to interact socially and professionally could reduce racism. Today, Mr. Woodson's efforts are very much still warranted. We are regularly reminded that racism and interracial conflict are still alive and well in our country, state, and community today. Black students are still being taunted or harassed, even assaulted, based on the color of their skin. Just one week ago, one of our students was harassed, demeaned, and had a drink thrown at them by a passing car which proudly displayed a Confederate flag. Yes, racism is alive, and I'm sad to admit, thriving in America today thanks to our former president. This week, as we entered Black History Month, we learned that multiple historically black colleges and universities were racially targeted with bomb threats, disrupt disrupting learning environments across the country. We recognize education as a fundamental human right, and it should be deeply concerning to everyone that when access to fair and equitable education is taken away from them. The timing and directionality of these bomb threats is a stark reminder of the paradoxical journey of black Americans, one filled with achievements born in the context of continued racially motivated violence and acts of terror against them. In response, we acknowledge the trauma of this week, condemn any future violence or threats of violence, and extend our care and concern to the communities served by historically black colleges and universities. As I watch our nation continue to buckle under the weight of racial prejudice and discrimination, I recognize and embrace my role as president, interim president, that is, of Western Oregon University. In bringing Oregonians together and in making sure all residents have equitable opportunities to learn and to thrive Together, we must address the structures 
that allow for systematic racism and injustice to continue. I am proud that our Board of Trustees is the first board of a public university in Oregon to have a board committee on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. I am also proud to be in the final phase of recruiting Western's first ever executive director of diversity, equity, and inclusion, who will become a member of my cabinet when hired. I'm also very proud that our students opened the Freedom Center in this very building at the start of the fall quarter this year. We are all people. We all have feelings and emotions. We all want to be included and treated with respect. Today our country is going in the wrong direction and is terribly divided. We must work together to reverse this trend and restore civility and respect in all things we do. As the old saying goes, united we stand, divided we will fall. Let's unite and be strong. Let's embrace diversity, equality, and inclusion. It builds strength and it brings out our best. Division breeds weakness and undermines our collective success. I am grateful that Carter G. Woodson created the space for us to have such dialogue with one another, to reach out to our brothers and sisters of all skin colors and join in a collective effort to make our state, nation, and community one that we can all be proud of. Thank you again for coming today and for all you do to make the world safe for all people. Our very future depends on our collective actions today. Thank you again for coming. The mayor of Monmouth, C. Scoots. Um, I also know her as uh, the school board, president of the school board, fin president of finance of the school board. She works there. Um, one of the things I do is volunteer at the Community Services Consortium. Um, one of the things that really pulls on my heartstrings is within Polk County, there aren't a lot of services for homeless. One of the things that uh, the mayor is doing is taking a look at how can we effectually be a part of uh, taking care of the 18-year-olds in foster care that get kicked out of the house? How can we take care of the, the hungry kids that are walking around? How can we feed the kids before they go into school um, so that they can learn? If you're hungry, you're not going to learn. Um, these are some of the efforts that I've seen with Mayor Coots. The other part is there's more to be done, and she has a vision for it. Mayor Cees Coots. Yeah, if only it just took a vision. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, Pastor Frank. Um, yes, Cees Coots, and in addition to my job as the Director of Finance and Operations at the School District, and serving as a member of the Board of Trustees of Western, I am very honored to be uh, serving as the mayor of Monmouth. And I'm particularly proud of uh, the group of counselors that we have and our staff and the work we have done just in the last couple of years to put a focus on people in our community who didn't always see themselves in our community. Um, Dr. Kenton's reminders of what our state was, and that's, that's recent, that hasn't gone away. His uh, mention of the student who just last week um, saw acts of racial aggression against him in our community. Our city staff, city manager and police chief are working on that um, already. They the next day, um, we, we are working on a way to stand up and say that is not okay. That is not okay in this community. We want to welcome people. We want to make sure that everybody is honored and understood um, and heard and seen. And I am humbled to be asked just to be here to recognize the contribution of black Americans, not only country, to our country, our government, our justice 
system, um, but to our culture and the work that is done here at Western to educate people, to turn people out into the country and the community with newfound understanding of our responsibilities to each other is one of the things I'm proudest of here. There's work to do, and the work will be done because I am committed to it, my city council is committed to it, our school district is committed to it, and this university is committed to it. So thank you. I look forward to more learning, more understanding, and more fellowship with all of you who are doing this work. Thank you. Um, Senator Jeff Merkley, uh, right now there's, is he in Oregon or uh, Washington? He's somewhere, he's not here. But he's right there. But his video is. But his video is here. Um, one of the things that, if, uh, if you go online, and I, I got the opportunity to Google and everything else, this man's working hard. Um, and some of the things I like and some of the, and it's just true with my dad as well. Some of the things I like and some of the things I don't like. Um, but he's working hard. He's finding out people's opinions. He's finding out where people stand and everything else. And he's pushing, pushing legislation through or trying to get it through that's going to level out the playing field. Um, some of that leveling out hurts because it feels like he's taking stuff away from some of our freedoms away. As Americans, we've got a lot of freedoms that can be taken away and we're not going to be hurting that bad. Um, so it's... I wish he was here because I got a couple of questions, but he's not, but we have a video. <laughs> Greetings to everyone attending today's kickoff meeting. Senator Jeff Merkley here, and thanks to the Monmouth City Council and everyone at Western Oregon University who helped organize today's event. Black History Month is a time for all of us, all across Oregon and across our nation to recognize the indescribable impact that generation upon generation of Black Americans have made to our nation. To celebrate Black culture and all of its contributions to America's past, present, and future, and to recommit ourselves to the struggle to achieve and ensure justice and equality for all of our citizens. That might seem difficult in today's charged environment. There's no question that the tumult and turmoil of the past few years have shown how far we still have to go to achieve that vision of justice and that vision of equality. The protests over the unjust murders of Black Americans and the rise of Black Lives Matter, a pandemic that has laid bare the vast inequalities in economics and health and housing and access to opportunities, a movement by some to erase or whitewash the history of our nation's struggle for racial justice, the struggles of Frederick Douglass and Dr. King, of W.E.B. Du Bois and James Baldwin and Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and Rosa Parks and so many more. But that history can't be erased because that history, the history of Black Americans, is the history of America. We have to learn it and learn from it because it informs every aspect of our nation and our society. We can't talk about the inequality of mass incarceration in our prisons without learning and talking about the 13th Amendment slavery clause that allowed freed Black Americans to be re-enslaved. We can't talk about economic inequality today without learning about the Jim Crow laws that determined when and where a black American could work and how they could earn a living and where they could live. And we can't talk about today's fight to stop attacks on Americans' voting rights without understanding the generations long struggles of the civil rights movement from the end of reconstruction to the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. To understand American history, you have to understand black history, plain and simple. So thank you again to not only everyone who helped organize today's event, but to everyone who is participating. Dr. King once said that human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the justice requires sacrifice, suffering and struggle, the tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. By being part of today's event, by learning, and by sharing the powerful stories of Black history in America, not just this month, but every day and every month of the year, each and every one of you is one of those dedicated individuals helping to move our country step by step toward the goal of justice and equality for all. We're gonna have a music break. 
Kaike, the band, is going to, they're setting up right now. Uh, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um, living in Washington, D.C. as a kid, um, 60, when did they burn down D.C.? 63? 64. 64. 68. Uh, my brother and I were standing on the front porch of our house, uh, northeast wa or northwest Washington, and Dad, there was a screen door, and Dad said, do not go outside. And the sun was going down, and it sounded very excited outside. There was a lot of noise and a lot of things going on, police sirens and everything else. And we wanted to go see what it was, and then there was a smell. And Dad said, come inside, come see the TV. They were burning down Washington, D.C., uh, 14th Street was on fire, all of it, and we just, it, I'm too young, I'm eight, nine years old, don't understand, and he said, go back outside and smell again, and this time when we smelled tears, we don't know why, but we're getting all clogged up and everything else, and he said, that's the tear gas that they're using against the people to get them back inside and everything else, don't get, go outside, but what will happen, they may shoot you, they may arrest you, you may get beaten up. There are people driving up and down the streets right now looking for people to hurt. That moment was significant in my life, but this incident that happened with the student, um, I told somebody one time that I was out in my front yard here, mowing my front yard here, and a big diesel truck came around the corner and had a Confederate flag floating and the wind and everything else. <laughs> And I was terrified because there were four or five white guys in there and they were hooting and hollering and, and I thought they were the ones looking for who they might beat up, who they might. So I stood behind the tree in my front yard and watched them go by. That is the last time in my life I will stand behind a tree and let someone like that go by. My job is to stand forward because when a student is attacked in the same way, that's my fault. Cheers.
just like to call Kaike, who is uh, the creator of this music today. He's uh, like, he got um, Harmony to come and sing and uh, put the band together. So Kaike, if you could come up and one more hand for the band. It's amazing. Um. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming over here to hear this, to, to, to come to this event. Um, this is my band. We're just high schoolers, you know. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so my guitar teacher, actually, Nathan, he told me that there was going to be an event at Wu and that they were looking for a you know, musician to play music at the event. Originally, it was just going to be me playing piano, you know, the whole time. And there wasn't going to be a band or a singer. It was all just going to be me. And so I got in contact with Carol over here. And I had an idea. And I told Carol that I was thinking of putting together a band, just high schoolers, just kids from my band, um, to, to come play at this event and to get a you know, Harmony over here to come sing. And Carol said that would be great. Carol said that they didn't really have music planned for the event. It was just going to be, you know, piano. So I did all of that, and I hit these guys up. They decided to come, and here we are, you know. You. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the next generation, I, before I introduce Deb Patterson, the next generation, one of the things that we got to see in Monmouth Independence were uh, people standing on the corner on the highway in Main Street. And there were a lot of young people out there. And uh, when you get old, <laughs> I love saying that about myself because I don't feel old, I just act that way. Um, when you get older, you kind of quit. And uh, it was really encouraging to me to have these kids out there, young kids, holding signs and absorbing the abuse. They, people would honk at them, not for the right reason. People were waving at them, but not using all five fingers. Um, people were making comments to them, but not asking them to come over for dinner. The things that they wanted to eat. Hmm. Um, so those comments were flying at these kids, and that encouraged me. Uh, in such a great way. Um, I talked about racism being in church. I walked into church Bible study one day and the them and those people conversation was going on. Man, you'd have thought somebody got in a fight with me. I came out of there screaming, ranting, and raving, and it took about 15 minutes and I left and that Bible study changed that day. But it wasn't because I did something. It was because young people had done something and encouraged me. We need each other. We need the young kids to play the music that encourages the, us to get up and dance, to stand on the corner and protest, to do the very things that we old people don't do, so that we old people will get up and do the things that we can. It's going to take all of us. So, Senator Deb Patterson, um, I saw a big smile and a big thank you from one of the other participants. Um, there is something right about doing something right. Uh, and just in watching that moment, Senator Patterson is doing something right and it's affecting the lives of others. Come and tell us. Thank you so much, Pastor Morris. Thank you, President Kenton. Thank you to everyone at Western Oregon University. Thank you, Mayor Kuntz, and all the members of this Monmouth City Council. Thank you all this afternoon. And hello to my colleague, Senator Lou Frederick, sitting over there, who will be speaking in a moment. 
Pastor Morris. I'm so glad you started with the land acknowledgement that Western Oregon crafted, the Board of Directors of Western Oregon crafted out of recognition this was not our land. This week in Senate Veterans and Emergency Preparedness, we heard testimony also by other Oregonians impacted by racism. We heard from Oregonians whose parents and grandparents had been sent to internment camps and who still served as American soldiers during World War II. We must remember the cruel injustice of the displacement of the indigenous people, of the internment of Japanese Americans. And also here in Oregon, as President Kenton has said, we have excluded black Americans by practice and by public policy from opportunities to work, own property, and even live in this state. We must remember the cruel injustice of these acts and these public policies and our shared history. History matters. Learning history matters. Learning from history matters as we forge the future together. One of the most important bills on the docket during this, sec this session is House Bill 4002 that would require farm workers to be paid overtime. The fact that we don't pay overtime to farm workers is based in the racist way that black farmers, farm workers were treated in intentionally excluding them from President Roosevelt's Fair Labor Standards Act, Act, which was part of the New Deal in 1938. It's no coincidence that the vast majority of farm workers who are being excluded from equal protection under the law with the Fair Labor Standards Act today are people of color. W.E.B. Du Bois, Senator Merkley mentioned him, a renowned black historian among many renowned black historians, knew that learning from history matters. This is why he spent his life recording history centered on the lives and work of black Americans. In a seminal essay on Reconstruction after the Civil War, he reminds us of the important contributions to restoring democracy that black Americans made to this country. I urge you to find and read his books if you haven't done so already, and the works of so many others, not just this February during Black History Month, but all through this year and every year. Why is black history important? Well, if we have to ask, that should be the obvious answer for why it's important. And not only is it important, it is urgent that we learn about and learn from black history because our current acts and our current public policies must be more fair and just. I'm glad we passed House Bill 2936 last session, which affirms anti-racist policies for social media accounts and background checks. It was part of the work of the Judicial Committee related to law enforcement, but all employers should have anti-racist policies for social media accounts of their employees and background checks. I'm also proud to say that I supported House Bill 3037, which makes childcare more affordable and accessible for low income and working families. In addition, I also supported House Bill 2681, which prohibits the display of hate symbols on school property, a bill brought by and carried by Senator Frederick. While these are good steps toward making Oregon a more inclusive place, we still have more work to do. Can I have an amen? <laughs> I'm a minister too. <laughs> Congregational. This session, I will also be prioritizing equity. Specifically, I'll be focusing on expanding access to health care 
and addressing racism as a public health crisis as a co-sponsor of House Bill 4052. Thank you for your work on that. I'm also sponsoring Senate Bill 1556, which creates a certification for caregivers, over 40% of whom are people of color, to help create a career ladder for entry-level workers in long-term care. I want to highlight Senate Bill 1579, which directs the Oregon Business Department to develop and implement the Equity Investment Program, similar to the every 10 acres. This program, if funded, and I'm supporting it, and I suspect Senator Frederick is too. He's nodding. Hold him to that. <laughs> Hold me to that. It will award grants to organizations that provide culturally responsive services to support economic stability, self-sufficiency, wealth building, and economic equity among disadvantaged individuals, families, businesses, and communities in Oregon. These are bills I believe our communities are calling for, despite that truck with the flags, right? As your senator from this district, it is of utmost importance to me that I help pass bills that benefit everyone in our communities, including people who are black, indigenous, and other people of color. I hope that these bills are a step in the right direction with the idea that I and we can always do better. We need to continue to learn history and learn from history to do that. Because I believe, and I believe that you all do too, that we want to be a part of writing a history that is welcoming and inclusive of all. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. So, looking up information about people that I have never met, Senator Lou Frederick, and I have a little bit in common that I didn't realize. Um, Alaska, um, going, doing all kinds of stuff. My dad is a PhD political scientist, MIT, Northwestern University, Morgan State, and I have had to listen to his lectures over and over and over. And he'll be at my church or New Life Ministries uh, tomorrow night, and I'll get to hear him again. And I love my dad. Um, one of the things about political scientists and people that, any individual that has an outside view of the world, is they see things differently than the way we might see it. My dad, two years before Donald Trump was elected, said, while we were in Ghana, said Donald Trump's going to get elected. And boy, did I laugh. And he was right. There is something that is inherent with understanding politics, with understanding history, with understanding the character of the individuals that are making decisions, that are making vo votes, that are putting policies forward, that if you don't know history, if you don't know the situation where you find yourself lying, you are bound to repeat the history of the past. Come change history. I introduce Senator Lou Frederick to you. Well, hello. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, the, the, the mayor and the president for, for inviting me. I appreciate that. Carol, where did you go? Oh, there you are right there. I thought I saw you over here. Thanks again as well. Um, and uh, Western Oregon University and the uh, Monmouth City Council. I really appreciate being here. My name's Lou Frederick. I'm a state senator for District 22 North and Northeast Portland. Uh, I struggle with trying to figure out just where to start and, and how much to put in. But first of all, I've got to say, it is great to, to see another faculty brat in the front, front of here. Uh, my father, is, uh, my father was a mycologist. In fact, he was the head of the botany department at Howard uh, at, for a while, but he was also at uh, Southern University, Atlanta University, uh, Central States. And uh, when he died a couple of years ago, he was a senior, senior um, researcher at Tuskegee, his alma mater. Um, Dad was uh, the last lab assistant for George Washington Carver. 
So uh, I, to say that my, my life has been steeped in black history is truly an understatement. Um, I found myself uh, at all sorts of levels uh, dealing with issues of, uh, of, of black history around the dinner table, as you did, but uh, you know, outside when we have, uh, have a barbecue or, or whenever we would go to different places, I had the, the uh, uh, my, my next door neighbor was uh, Horace Mann Bond, uh, Julian Bond's dad. Julian was actually my next door neighbor for a while is there. Uh, and there were a number of other people. Are we, I, my, my story is, you mentioned your tear gas. My tear gas was when I was eight years old in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, and it was not directed officially at me. It was a group of students who had gone downtown to, to sit at the uh, Woolworths lunch counter and were not served as they walked out of the door. They got tear gassed and they rushed and jumped into the car that I happened to be in. Uh, and they were filled, they were full of tear gas, so that's when I got my first tear gas. And I was in the middle of the, of the civil rights movement growing up. Um, we moved from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and Scotlandville, Louisiana, to Atlanta, Georgia. So from the frying pan into the fire, basically. Uh, as I said, my next door neighbor was, one of my next door neighbors was Julian Bond. But my other next, my other playmates, uh, my classmates were, uh, or schoolmates were Yolanda, Marty, and Dexter King. So Dr. King was the father of my playmates. He was the fellow who told me to quit running through the house and to sit for a little bit and, and not, and, and don't, don't get uh, too excited, Lou. You, you just need to rest and, and, and relax and just listen for a little bit. Um, he um, was also, uh, he also echoed what my folks always said, which was an interesting sort of comment, which was, uh, your job as an adult is to make things better for the people who come after you. That's what, that was he bought something he said, or something my folks said, or something all the adults said. So every other weekend we would march. Uh, we would have Klan members on either side of the street throwing things at us. Uh, we would have uh, all sorts of other things. We didn't go to the Selma march because my sister had chicken pox uh, that weekend. So we, we didn't make it to that. But I ended up uh, desegregating my high school, which was an interesting time, as you can well imagine, 1964. Uh, and we were, and I, so I, I walked into the high school, it was a court case, and they're finally starting to, to, um, um, to uh, talk about my, my attorney, Carol, uh, Carol Baker Motley, Carol, Carol ba Baker Motley, who was uh, my attorney. Uh, she, was, she became a federal judge eventually, but they're finally putting together stories on her. But I ended up um, the first day getting people yelling at me as I walked in. And the, par and the kids of those parents were, um, were made it a point of trying to, trying to make sure that I was going to feel uncomfortable and, and, and fight with me. Now, I was only four foot ten at the time, so I was a little guy, and there were lots of bigger people there, and I ended up dealing with fights uh, as well. But I, I dealt with it in a different way because I was dealing, because I was regularly seeing Dr. King, because we were marching constantly, and because he and my folks were telling me that the, the goal was to make things better. And you don't make things better necessarily by, by in, in being involved in a fight, intentionally involved in a fight. You try to make sure that other things are done. So it was a, um, a determination for us to do things. Now, let me give you a sense of how that worked with my family, because it's a little, um, it's a little strange at times. Every summer, we would travel to all of the, to the American Institute for Biological Sciences meetings. Uh, they were held all across the country. So one time, as we were heading for um, Boulder, Colorado, uh, we were going through, um, going through Illinois, I'm sorry, going through Missouri, Missouri, and just about to reach Independence, Missouri. Independence, Missouri, not Independence, Oregon. And we were traveling through, uh, going to Independence, or, uh, Missouri. My father looked over. He did this all the time. Um, he, he looked over and he said, well, that's where Harry Truman's library is. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we stop by there? Now, you know, you just, that was not something that most folks did. But we decided to do that. So we drove over. We parked the car had all of our gear on the top of the car, and station wagon, of course, and that kind of thing. We got, got, got out of the car, walked towards the parking lot, and, 
through, through the parking lot. I got about halfway through the parking lot, and we suddenly had these people in uniforms, not military uniforms, but docent uniforms for the library, come rushing out to us. And they grabbed us, and they moved us on through the museum, and the library, rather, and into an auditorium. And in the auditorium, there were a whole group of people, a you know, little stage like this set up. And, we, and they put us on the front row of the, of the, uh, the library auditorium. And we said, what is going on? Because we were not expecting this. We did not know what was, what was happening. And, and a little bit later, there was a, they were giving an award to President Truman. And so President Truman came out, and he immediately got the award. He was very pleased and everything. And of course, as soon as he left, as soon as he finished getting the award, he got off the, the stage and went and talked to us. His, his, his folks wanted to have us as, a, as poster children for, for being there at the, at the Truman Library. Now, that was just fine as far as my dad was concerned because Truman was one of my father's, uh, not only say heroes, but he, was certainly, he certainly was one of the people he admired because he had managed to, de to integrate the uh, armed services while my dad was in the service. So he thought that was really an important thing. Um, so we ended up having uh, Harry Truman. So I can say, um, and, I, and I'm, I'm pleased to actually say this, I have talked with every president since Harry Truman. Um, and that, that was sort of fun. Well, I have no desire to talk with the previous guy, so. Uh, but uh, it was one of those things where it was just a determination. This is the kind of thing that we did. My father made it a, made it a point of getting into places where we were not expected to be. Uh, and that was his, his major, one of his major efforts was to, we would go to the Na Nature Conservancy meetings for Georgia, and they had never seen a black person in the Nature Conservancy meeting for Georgia. Uh, they, we would go to all across, the, all across the country, and you mentioned Alaska, he, what, what he was alluding to was the fact that neither one of us had been to Alaska. You've been to Alaska, well that's not fair. Oh, that's not fair. Okay, well, you, you, you've got me beat there. That's the only state I haven't been to. But I managed to get around the states of the United States, but I also managed, as a television reporter for 17 years, I got to go to all of the counties in the state of Oregon. And I only had a couple of bad experiences, I'll put it that way, uh, difficult experiences. And, and, and two, of them, two of those experiences took place before I was a reporter. Uh, Medford um, uh, police officers, two different years, told me that uh, I, was, I had to be out of town by sundown. That was 1975 and 76. Um, I've also, but I also have to deal with the fact that I have police officers pulling me over in my neighborhood, um, usually once a year. I have been, have, was not pulled over yet last year because most people weren't out, primarily. Yeah, not, well, last year, I said, I, I, I'm not, not counting for them. But uh, I was usually pulled over at least once a year. But I had police officers pulling me over, asking whether I was lost or not, whether they, I needed help, because I was obviously in a, in a gentrified neighborhood and I wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, that was a, and I, when, I, when I told one officer that I ended, the last guy who I talked with about that, I said, you know, I know why you're pulling me over. He said, oh, I just, you know, just concerned about it. I said, no, I know why you're pulling me over. You don't expect me to be here. I get that. Now, why am I going through this neighborhood slowly? Because I live right there. But it was not something that was ex expected. These are the kinds of issues that we're still trying to struggle with. And we can go down the list. And unfortunately, the list is long. But we can go down the list. What we really need to be doing, though, is figuring out what the next steps will be, where we want to go. What should the world look like? What should Oregon look like? How can we deal with Oregon in a way that's going to actually bring things up, not only in terms of, um, of obvious uh, public safety, because we really need to have police officers understanding that they are not warriors but peace officers. There's a difference, and there's a different mindset that takes place. There's a, um, one of my friends was in Ashland uh, uh, a couple of years ago, and he, he was standing there and noticed a police officer there, and on, on, on the police officer's bumper sticker was peace officer. And he went over to her and said, now, does, does, this, 
change the way people look at you? And he, she said, no, but it changes the way I look at other people. That's a different mindset altogether there, too. Um, we also need to be changing things in terms of housing and, uh, and, in, uh, and getting uh, business loans and, and, and doing other things related to um, uh, uh, health care and, and, and other, other issues. For me, the issue is education. It's one of my key, my key issues. Because we do not need to be having uh, kids especially black kids, it's not a remedial situation for folks. It's discovering what it is that they are strong in and, and encouraging that strength rather than somehow believing that by, by, um, by uh, disciplining them, by, by somehow creating problems for them, you're going to make them feel as though they want to learn. I want all students in Oregon to want to learn. I don't want them turned off by, by tests, I don't want them turned off by all sorts of detention issues or anything like that. We need to have support. And one of the things that I think we've seen as a result of this pandemic is that we've seen the holes in our safety net. And now we can begin to change things. Now, now we can do that. I am so excited when I talk with students because I, you know, I used, to, used to, like a regular adult, I'd go in and say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, and, the, and I stopped doing that. I now ask students, what, what problem do you want to solve when you grow up? What do you want to solve right now? That's a different mindset altogether, too. And we need to find a way to make sure that that's what's going on. I really am, uh, am excited about the fact that we actually have the attention of the world on changing things. Black History Month is a classic example of, of how we can do that, but it's got to be um, Black History Month is a, uh, a year-round situation. So is, so, does, so is indigenous history and, and, and Asian history and Latinx history uh, and, and Pacific Islander history. All of those groups of people who have been ignored, we have not ignored the contributions and ignored the, the challenges as well. So it's time for us to make those changes. That's what I'm working at. And what I am so pleased to see, and what I, I, I cannot begin to tell you, is uh, I've got a chance to work with Deb Patterson, who brings these issues forward so that I don't have to. <laughs> and because it's not something that I have to change, it's not, it's not, I'm not worried so much about it. It is, it is speaking to the, um, to the Euro population about what's going on. And that's a different approach than what we've had to see, what we've seen in the past. So I am, I'm pleased to see that. Now I'm also pleased to see, and I, it, it, at one, when I came into the Oregon House, I was the only African American person in the Oregon House. Um, um, Jackie Winters was the senator. Uh, the black senator. So uh, when Jack, when I, I used to joke that when I went over to the Oregon Senate to see Jackie, the whole capital sort of tilted a little bit. But the fact is now we have 15 people of color in the Oregon, Oregon legislature. Pretty amazing. And we will be, we will be probably having more as well. I mean, that's, that's right now. We will have more as well. What's more important is not just the Oregon legislature, but the city councils, the county commissions, the school boards. All of these folks are beginning to understand that we have a change that's got to take place and that we've got people who need to do that. So I want to thank you for inviting me to be here, and I invite you to get involved with making sure that Oregon looks like the people in Oregon, or the, our, Oregon's politics look like the people in Oregon. And, and let's see what we can make things, make things better and bring out a, an Oregon that we're all proud of. That 10 years down the line, uh, we will know that they're gonna be doing things. I talk to, the, talk to students and I say to them, I want you happy, healthy, wealthy, pleased with everything because you're gonna be choosing my nursing home, you know? Uh, and, and I want you to make sure that you're doing very well. So let's see if we can get our scientists and poets and all philosophers and all sorts of folks in this state doing well. And we can only do that if we get, make sure that all of the folks are doing well. Thank you very much.
One thing I want to add, um, and I had I thought about, I'm uh, four generations away from slavery. You would be similar. Um, my great grandfather, uh, Lorenzo Marsh, was uh, traded in uh, South Carolina, and there in South Carolina, he had. Four generations. Okay. He had uh, 13 kids, and when he turned 30 years old, they sold him to Louisiana. Um, in Louisiana, they couldn't understand his language, so he became Morris instead of Marsh. And in Louisiana, he had 14 kids, and I am his great great grandchild from that history. Um, one of the things that happens is, as black families, um, I fight. My dad, my dad's a great example. He fights to keep his family together. He fights to know every member of his family. Um, I have cousins that I've never met that my dad can tell you stories about and everything else. We need to reinstate and assist in the building of families again. Um, it's too easy to use the divorce word to walk away and everything else. We have kids out there that are coming from broken homes. Um, and part of that brokenness will affect our society as a whole. That's just a quick sub-note. Let's have some happy sounds. Jackson. Okay. Now, 
sometimes you go on and you look up somebody and everything else, and uh, the only thing that you can say when you're doing it is, damn. <laughs> damn. So I'm going to tell a quick Alaska story. Uh, my wife and I got to go up to Alaska, and we were in Anchorage, and we were looking for a place to eat, and there was this really cool little funny restaurant, and it had the name Waffles and Whatnot. And it looked really kind of fun and everything else, so we went there, and it was a breakfast place, and it had formerly been a cart uh, restaurant. And we walked in, and it was a black-owned business. Now, where in Alaska are you going to find a black-owned business? And in one of the front tables had 15 airmen uh, from the local Air Force base, and half of those guys were black. Where are you going to find a group of black guys together? And one of the things that bothers me here in Monmouth is you see three black guys together, and the first thing is, well, I wonder what team they're on. Come on, really? I wonder what they're studying. I wonder what their major is. I wonder, what they're, I wonder what they do for free time. I wonder if they live in town, if they have to leave and go away on the weekend. I wonder if they have friends, local friends. I wonder what they're doing right now. Why, what are they talking I wonder, eh. So, in looking up this, this woman and her business, damn. Her vision for what we can do, for what is available, for what is possible, not only for black women, but for us, us knuckleheads, is amazing. So I'd like to introduce you to Julian Jackson. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to thank you all for having me at this event to celebrate Black History Month. May we also celebrate those making black history in this moment. Uh, <laughs> And may we also uplift those who will come behind to do more when the, we could, than we could ever imagine today. When I was asked to speak on the topic uh, of black joy, I was excited. And I thought that this was going to be simple, right? This is something I do all the time. Uh, but I'm going to honor my feelings today. And I'm going to say that after hearing about the murder of Amir Locke, on the birthday of Trayvon Martin, I'll admit that black joy is not as easy a topic as it should be. So I remind myself in this moment that black joy is an act of resistance. So before I get to the business of celebrating all that we are, let us take a moment to remember those who are no longer with us, whether we know their name or not. The origins of black joy as a concept date back to the start of black history itself. Although it's garnered more attention in recent years, simply due to the version of black history taught today that focuses largely on pain and struggle, but I assure you we have been singing, dancing, and creating joyful traditions since time immemorial. Black people are and continue to be literally the beginning of everything. From the first human known to man to being the first at so many other things, we have birthed a nation. We built it, we've enriched it, and have always and continue to hold a level of humanity for others that is absolutely astounding and often undeserved. From our ancestors, we have received a seemingly unending amount of hope. Being black in America, being black in Oregon, just being black wherever one may find themselves often means unsolicited stares, under breath comments, blatant disrespect, black body trauma and repeated trauma as we view those that look like us snuffed out publicly time and time again, and yet we move like water, navigating daily systems that were not designed for us. And even through all this, more than anything, what separates black people from all others is our resilience, our compassion, our fortitude, and last but not least, our joy. Black people are 
Again, black people are and continue to be the beginning of everything. I want to talk today about maintaining and expanding that joy. It's black men and women. As black men and women, we are taught that we are not enough, that our mental health and our pain and our generational trauma are irrelevant. And often, we are pushed to just keep going. I want to challenge that. We were never less than, and we are in a position to change the narrative on the way that we love ourselves and those in our community. One of my heroes, Angela Davis, spoke often on the need to take care of oneself, practicing yoga and meditation even while imprisoned. We have seen Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka choose themselves on the world stage. We have been blessed to witness Dwayne Wade turn against misogynistic norms to be there for his child and blessed to see Michael Jordan cry publicly over the loss of a dear friend. We are in a beautiful time of awakening in America and none are waking up faster than we are. And I, for one, I'm for that. This is how we maintain our inherent joy. We began to challenge the white supremacist ideas that we have about ourselves. We free ourselves from the bondage of conformity, doing so with the knowledge that we were never supposed to be this. We learn our heritage and we learn how to decolonize our thoughts. I had an amazing conversation with someone the other night and something they said struck me. We weren't made slaves because we weren't valuable. In fact, quite the opposite is true. We are quite valuable indeed. Our land, our knowledge, our ability to create and build all had value. We must shed ourselves of this skin. It's not ours. Our men are not super predators or savages. Daily, they bear the entire brunt of America's bitterness. They are strong, courageous, and deserve to be allowed to step into their tenderness and take their armor off. Our women are not angry. We are unheard, misunderstood, and put upon with the responsibility that was never meant to be ours alone. Our black girls are not fast. They are missing with no one looking. Our black boys are not inherently bad, but they are often struck down or incarcerated before they can even decide what they will be. Our black queer and trans communities aren't sinful. They are what our African ancestors have celebrated long before our arrival here and are dying more rapidly than any demographic. It is time for us to remember who we are and run towards our power and our magic with open arms. Displaying joy and meeting your needs is an act of resistance. Letting go of your hardness is an act of resistance. And it is the only path towards healing and the establishment of true equity. And damn it, truly loving everything you are is straight up rebellion. By choosing acts of love and joy for ourselves and others in the face of hatred, we can feel ourselves regain our own humanity. Maintaining joy will not change laws. It certainly won't always change hearts but it is the ultimate act of defiance in a world where your joy is not considered. You are worthy. Your value, immeasurable. Your skin is perfect and your strength, unmatched. Treat yourself accordingly. As I close, <laughs> I want to, you, to encourage you to also work to remove pain points for our communities of color by supporting legislative change. 
Current, uh, a current bill that needs your support is Senate Bill 1510, which aims to change stops and arrests, parole and probation, as well as secure funding for culturally specific programming. Thank you, and I appreciate your time. My wife and I go to Winnebagana every summer. We've been going there seven years, five years, seven. Anyway, um, we went there one time, and there was a, a room this big, but it had balcony all the way around. And we were with 5,000 Africans, educated, PhDs, master's degrees, head of departments, dean of, president of, the cardinal of the, I mean, everybody was there, and then students down the middle. And as they were having this conversation and everything else, they started playing music. And it was one of the most joyful times I have ever had in my life because you could feel it coming. They were gonna dance and they were gonna dance joyfully and there was absolutely no way to stop them. But they weren't done with the program. And I can remember the, the vice chancellor standing up front, putting up his arms saying, stop, wait, wait, not yet. We have one more thing to do. Oh man, the chairs are moving and you can hear people and there's his side. I've never seen that in America. <laughs> the day that Obama got elected, my mom called me on the phone. She was in Texas and I was here. And she said, we did it, we did it. And I was so happy. And then I had to go to work the next day. And it was not a, it was different. Sometimes I'm really sad being in this place, sometimes. I need someone to pull me up and remind me that I have value. Thank you. So the next speaker, um, Angel Harris. Now, <laughs> I asked her before this whole thing started, I said, look, I found out all this information about you and I've got it listed. And she said, that's the other Angel Harris. <laughs> yeah, but I've got this really quote, cool quote right here and she's, that's the other Angel Harris. So she said, don't worry about it. Just step aside. I'll introduce myself. So ladies and gentlemen, Angel Harris. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. I got to like recover from the Julian Jackson. And quite frankly, I have to recover from this whole program because this is more than a program, right? What were you doing when you were 14 years old in high school? Were you singing the Black National Anthem? Thank you, Harmony. Did you take your Saturday off to celebrate Black History Month in Monmouth, Oregon, home of 10,000? plus our university students, you don't want to forget about them, right? What were you doing at 14 years old? Powerful, y'all. So I have to take a moment. I am a, one of those criers anyways. Uh, I feel deeply. And that's why I brought my phone up here so I could put my timer on. I'm the last one, so I want to make sure to honor your time, but I'm a talker. So I'm looking out for y'all, okay? I want to first of all thank Carol, the city of Monmouth, senators in the house, Lou Fredrickson and Senator Patterson. I want to thank each of you. Ke no, Keiko, did I get that right? Kaiki. See, I'm messing people's names up. But this young man, I'm inspired, y'all. Because again, I'm 45. At 14 years old, as you'll hear a little bit, I didn't know much, and I didn't know what I didn't know. And I suspect there's a lot of y'all in this room that don't know what you don't know. Right? And that's why we're here. We're learning, and we're growing. And that's some good stuff. That's some juicy stuff. Right? So, enough of that. My name is Angel Harris, 
I'm not much into the title thing, so it's actually perfect that when he Googled the wrong Angel Harris, who is also a part of the NAACP National um, and the Legal Defense Fund, he got her. See, I told him he had to Google Angel Harris Corvallis. Greetings from Corvallis. <laughs> but I loved it because, again, I'm not into the whole title thing. I really always think that I'm uh, just wanting to make the world a better place. That's kind of always been my thing as a little girl is that I want to make the world a better place. And for me, titles don't necessarily do that. They open doors though, y'all. I am learning that. They open some doors. But my title does not really tell you who I am. So I'm going to tell you that myself. Okay? And because I want to stay on cue, see, I'm off, I'm off track. I'm gonna, I'm, I, I even typed this up for y'all so I can stay. Okay? <sighs> So I am at the first annual, right, Mama's first annual Black History Month program. <laughs> I've been to a couple of first annuals, and let me tell you, the exciting part about the first is that we get to do it again and again, and it's never the first again, right? And we can always go, well, it's 2022, what happened? What took so long? We can kind of beat us up, ourselves up, but I still remember that quote, right? When we know better, we do better. So there's always an opportunity to do the right thing. So that's why I'm excited to be here. I wanna thank Jason J. Dorsett, president, current president of our Lynn Benton uh, NAACP, because he could not be here today, which meant I could. <laughs> so thank you, President Dorsett. So who am I, first of all, because sometimes our stories, right, our testimonies. Uh, Senator Patterson was preaching up here, by the way. I thought we were gonna do an altar call <laughs> and pass the plate all at the same time. But our testimony, right, because we overcome by the word of our testimony, right, in the blood of the lamb, is what the Bible says. So my testimony tells you way more about me than my credentials, actually. So first of all, I'm a mom of three kids, 16-year-old, a 14-year-old, and an 11-year-old. I should just stop right there. And you may want to do something for me after hearing that, right? You, right? I'm also a wife of, of one. You have to be very specific these days. I got one husband, wife of one, right? I am a registered nurse. And I'm currently getting my master's degree in nursing at Linfield, so I'm back at Linfield. I also am an adjunct now, um, nursing faculty at Bushnell in Eugene. And I will start my first, teaching my first class in May. <laughs> Happy Black History to all of us. And if you know anything about healthcare, if you know anything about the history of nursing, you will understand what a big deal that is. Yeah, and identify as a black woman, by the way. I am the past president, as you can see on the screen, of the Lynn Benton NAACP. That also tells you a lot about me as well. That is a volunteer position, but it was a full-time position. I actually took off, I, I quit my nursing job to dedicate that, those two years to our community because it is a full-time job, right? Social justice work is not a part-time gig. It's our lives. It should be all of our lives, actually. I, it doesn't stop when I go to work. Whatever my job is, wherever I am, whether if, if I'm sitting in, in this legislation or legislature, right? If I'm sitting, if I'm whatever, office jobs, social justice work does not stop there. It does not begin in this room, right? And when I leave this room, there's still justice work to be done, right? So I, I, I focused and did that for two years, right, as a president. Now, I didn't tell you what I was doing before that. I was also an executive team before that as well. I'm also a racial equity consultant and I love building bridges. I love it, y'all. It's gonna take all of us. 
even those we don't agree with. Probably especially those we don't agree with, actually. So when we talk about building bridges, we remind ourselves, especially as a black woman, that I am not, I'm a bridge builder, but I am not the bridge that you walk over. I had that confused for a long time, right? And what, what is my purpose of being a racial equity consultant? It sure is a fancy title, but my purpose is to meet with individuals and organizations and help towards racial healing, right? Racial healing and community healing. And what I tell people is I really need you to respect and treat people like people. I don't know if there's a title for that, y'all, how to be kind to each other, how to fight for each other. Don't know if there's a, so I just called it racial equity consultant, but it's really like Rodney King, can we all just get along? <laughs> and it sounds really basic, but it's really hard. It's really hard. So we heard earlier about Carter G. Woodson, the father of black history. Thank you so much. Very powerful, by the way. We got a background history on Black History Month, which started out as a week, right, in 1926, and then moved into a month in 1976, which is the year I was born, 45 years ago. And we see ourselves today continuing to pack 400, over 400 years of black history in America into 28 days. That was not his, that was not the goal, y'all. We're not supposed to actually, like a celebration, right? When I have my birthday, it's not saying, Angel, we're only going to acknowledge you and celebrate you on December 4th, just in case y'all wanna get me some gifts. December 4th, right? That's not what, he, that, is, that was not what it was supposed to be. It's supposed to be, yes, we have our birthdays, but Angel, we're gonna also remember you throughout the, day, throughout the years, right? Valentine's Day is great, but hello, can you imagine your spouse or your partner only acknowledging you on one day? That was not the goal. So here we find ourselves 45 years later, over 400 years later, still saying, Black Lives Matter. Black history is American history. How many more years do we continue to cry, not even say it, but crying that out, right? When do we see the humanity in black lives? Because again, we are people, fully human, not animals, not things, to be owned by people with feelings and stuff. And if you Angel Harris, you got lot. sorry. Angel Harris Corvallis, you got lots of feelings. I'm gonna keep giving you a hard time, Pastor. <laughs> we got, we, as Julianne said, we got lots of joy. I always tell people because I think sometimes they just wanna be like, oh, you poor. Black girl, that's how you should see myself, actually. And I said, you know, we can talk about racism without always talking about these poor black people who were slaves. There was more to our story, way more to our story than that. So I, I always sit before people, stand before people, Zoom before people, and I remind them, let, lest we not forget, I'm thriving in life. I'm thriving. Thriving. You know, we can, it doesn't have to be, and, right? It doesn't have to be like either you're struggling or you're not. I can struggle and still have joy, y'all, right? So don't look at me and say, oh, that poor black woman. Actually, I am amazing. Amazing. And it's not just me. Some people are like, you're different. You're not like the rest of them. It's like, I know a lot. Actually, they're way better than me. I mean, nothing against me, I'm pretty cool. But they're, like, I'm like right here. Like, I'm in the middle, y'all. Nothing against myself, I'm pretty cool, but I'm in the middle. When you think I'm the exception to the rule, 
That's a problem. There's plenty of us, plenty of us. You just gotta get to know us. You gotta humanize us, right? We get to be people with joy and with some struggles, struggles that we didn't necessarily create at times, right? And we get to acknowledge that. Whew, we get to acknowledge. Isn't that a strong word? When we acknowledge something, we get to acknowledge it, and then we go, how are we going to fix it? How are we going to fix it? What are we going to do about it? Because, again, I'm thriving, y'all. And it feels really good to thrive, especially when people put you in little boxes. Have you ever been put in a little box? As a black woman, I've been put in lots of boxes. Didn't even know I was in the box. Have you ever been in a box and never knew you were in a box because that's all you knew? You only knew this little space and you were allowed to occupy that space and once you stepped out of that little space, people got real nervous. I didn't even know. Not only was I in a box, I was put in a box. I thought that that was all I could do was what was in this box, y'all. Angel the Harris. Corvallis. I tell my kids about it all the time. Who I see myself as. Who do you see yourself as? Well, I can't do nothing, Angel. What can I do? What can I do as a white person? What can I do as a black person? What can I do as an immigrant to this country? I don't even understand your history. What can I do? And I think about how we all are put in these boxes that, and these shackles that say we can't do anything about it. It's a lie. And if it was not a lie, I, I know I wouldn't be here. I tell people all the time, there is not a job that would pay enough for me to waste my time <laughs> to tell my story, which is a treasure, and to talk to people who don't necessarily care anything about me. But because I know there's hope, I can do this all day, y'all. I can do it all day knowing that there's hope, that people change because I changed, and I see people changing all the time, in all the shades and all the colors. Because when I talk about a box, again, I'm not just talking about white people. I'm not just talking about black people, and for some, they don't even know what the heck how they identify. That wasn't a real sentence, but I made that. They don't even know what the heck they identify. I loved it. You can quote that. <laughs> can you imagine going through your life biracial, multiracial, and not having a clue where you belong because we all know race is made up. <laughs> and you cannot just look at Angel Harris and say what she is. You wouldn't have known. I could have been the, from, from the Dominican Republic. I could have been from Africa. You have no idea. But I am judged by this melanin, this beautiful melanin in my skin. Right? So when I say we all need to know who we are, I literally mean all of us because in some ways we have been put in a box that tells me you can't do it, and it's not true. And as we celebrate Black History Month, we are reminded over and over and over again of those who did, which is why we are here. Think about Dr. King. We can think about Dr. King because we just celebrated his birthday last month. That's why I bring the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. up. Because we know he's not the only one. But he's fresh in our minds because we just celebrated him last month. Rosa Parks. She's not the only one. Because remember, there's a slew of us. Black joy, come on, Julianne, black joy, right? There's a slew of us that stood and knew that we could do something more, we could change things. Rosa Parks would have celebrated her birthday yesterday. Yes? 109 she would have been. And if anyone knows about anything about Rosa Parks, first of all, about Rosa. Rosa was a part of the NAACP. We were taught that it was just some kind of fluke that what happened on the bus was just some general thing that, oh, I just decided one day. They had been planning this. 
and because you have to plan. When you do justice work, you can't just be flimsy about it. You gotta have a plan. <laughs> they had a plan, right? And they knew they had to use Rosa. Why did they have to use Rosa, y'all? Does anyone know? Yes, look at you. Because she's light-skinned. It would not have worked with Angel Harris Corvallis. And that, think about that. They used Rosa Parks because they knew, because you have to plan, you have to be strategic. Right, Senator Fredericks? You have to be strategic. This was a plan, y'all, right? And it didn't stop with her saying no on the bus. What did it take to make it successful? The boycott, which takes people, not just black people, all the people, y'all, all the people. So if we think we're gonna do some real work, just think about, think back to all the amazing black folks that left legacies that I get to stand up here. Think about what happened. Think about the white folks who died standing, right? We say ally. I don't know if ally is a strong enough word of what those white folks were doing, right? It wasn't about just being in a meeting and saying, oh, don't talk that way to Julianne. They really had to lose some stuff, y'all. To, st to stand up. What the president said up here today, yeah, that takes a lot of courage. And as Brene Brown would say, daring leadership. For some people listening to him, that is not gonna go over well. That's what it takes. It takes angels saying, I can't help myself because I have to speak up. And if you don't like it, right? Because like, I think of a senator who said, it's not like we're trying to cause trouble. It's more like John Lewis. This is good trouble. And for those who are like me, who wanted to be, to do everything right, to check all the boxes, I thought trouble was bad. I didn't know doing the right thing can also get you in trouble. <laughs> and people pleasers don't do well. <laughs> Social justice. I found that out the hard way as well. Because people are not gonna like you when they wanna continue white supremacy. When they wanna stay comfortable because this is not comfortable work for anyone, including us, brown and black people who are still in the box. Because we've been told you can only do this. How dare you be a senator? How dare you even think you can lead the NAACP as a black woman? How dare you think you can be adjunct nursing faculty and maybe one day be associate, right? Like, who are you? And you, you better not be thinking you're gonna be a dean one day. Like, don't you dare even go there. It's okay for you to stay in the box of being a CNA, being a nursing assistant, but don't you dare think higher than that. You're just Angel Harris from Vicksburg, Mississippi. You're a very nice girl, stay that way. Be quiet. Don't talk too much. We'll invite you into the table, just don't try to shake things up. How dare you, black person, succeed? How dare you? Ugh. And when we think about Dr. King even, right? What's the narrative? He was so peaceful, just so peaceable. The man who knew it wasn't going well for him, right? Right, he knew people were after him, literally. He was arrested how many times? What was that? So now we're told to be more 30. We were told to be more like Dr. King, but I don't think people understand who Dr. King was. He was, you know, his wife, Coretta Scott King. Y'all know her. I got to meet her. I got the Content of Character Award in high school, in Grant High School, y'all. I thought I was really doing some. I didn't know they gave awards for that. Like, 
being all peaceable and stuff. I didn't know. Thought you had to be out there loud and doing some stuff. I was a scared girl. I was a scared young lady. Right? But Coretta knew the, des- like the purpose of her husband's life. And they follow God. And I'd be loving me some Jesus, by the way. Everybody knows, knows that who knows me. But you have to follow something to do social justice work, y'all. Or you will go crazy. That's why some people talk about joy. Because you will lose your mind in social justice work. And, and what we've seen is you will lose your life, some of us. So Coretta had to know, whether the, she had to know that there was a bigger purpose for her husband. She had to know, because when he thought, well, maybe I should stay home with the kids and be with you, she says, no, Martin, you go. You think with the bomb in your house, right, you would quit. Some people tell me, it's too hard. It's too hard, Angel. This is too hard. Oh, <laughs> and those are white people. And I just say, you have no idea. And they still did it, y'all. Right? And, and nobody's calling anyone to be a martyr. Mm-mm, none of that. But we are, we, I am calling you to stand up and play your part in what you're supposed to do. It does not look like, right? Like, what I'm supposed to do, no, you, you don't have to be up here. This is what I'm supposed to do. My name is Angel, which means heavenly messenger. Now I know why I talk so much, y'all. <laughs> look at that, forgot to put the timer on everything. What do they say at church? You know, stay with me. I'll be closing. Stay with me. I don't see nobody sn- sleeping yet, maybe. Okay, you're not sleeping. Okay, good. At first I thought you were, but then you're, you know, you get the mask so high. But anyways, back to what I was saying. They did not give up. Whew. How powerful is not giving up? Knowing that there could be death on the other side even. Right? So when we talk about what's uncomfortable, that does not compare to me with death. Me being uncomfortable, I always tell people, I'm used to being uncomfortable. If I'm not uncomfortable, I think something's wrong sometimes. Because have you ever been in a room where you're the only one quite often? Right? It's a little bit uncomfortable. Have you ever experienced that? And if you haven't, you really need to. You really need to know how that feels. Not to be the majority. It is a powerful lesson. It is a very powerful lesson. And you want to give up because you don't see anyone else looking like you. And then you begin to believe the lies. Well, the reason why they're not X, Y, and Z is because they. Until you find out there's this thing called systemic racism. And that moment for me, y'all, happened, don't judge me, in 2012, because of Trayvon Martin. So I've talked about Rosa, I've talked about Dr. King, and I want to talk to you really briefly about another key person who changed my life and left a legacy. And this one's the saddest of all. 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, who would have been 27 today, was murdered. His mom was actually at Oregon State University 2019. I got to meet her. And she, she speaks around the country. She actually read for office. Amazing woman. But you shouldn't have to, right? You shouldn't have to be doing those things after the death and murder of your 17-year-old son with Skittles in his pocket. And for me, all of my life, even as a Mississippi girl, I came in Oregon, you know, 1990 as an eighth grader. I didn't know, um, I, I didn't really know about racism. I mean, when, you, when most of your town, 60 or so percent is black, as a, a little girl, you don't, and it, all the segregation, right? You just go about life, right? You move to Oregon in eighth grade, and all of a sudden, I'm black. And there are these people who are biracial, multiracial, and we don't have that because it's not okay in Mississippi, 
right? So even then we were busing, by the way. In seventh grade, we were busing, trying to integrate still, right? So when I come to Oregon, there's this thing, and I'm black. And I'm trying to figure out what that really means because apparently it's a negative thing. And if you're 14 years old, like our young people over here, you would think by then you would know like what that means. But I had no idea because in Mississippi, they were all black. You don't just sit around and talk about it. <laughs> you just get up and go to work and do your thing and laugh and play and have family reunions, you go to church. But in Oregon, it was a conversation of, oh, Mississippi burning, because they had watched that movie about the KKK. Didn't know anything about Grant's past and Portland's history with the KKK, but they wanted to tell me about Mississippi and how bad Mississippi was. As an eighth grader, y'all, and I had a really thick accent back then, and you learn really easy how to change that so you fit in, and now I miss it, but it's okay. I know who I am, right? So I thought, Angel, who wants to just please everybody, right? First child, mom, ended up being a mamie to most things, which is how can I serve everyone but myself, right? The mamie who is the maid and that's the nurse, right? I just take care of everybody. I just wanted to know how I could serve all the people. And if we educated each other, right? Let's just educate, let's talk about racism. If there, there is racism, but it's just a couple of people. Right? All we have to do is talk. And I believe that. I went to OSU in 95, and I still didn't get it. People were saying things to me, touching all of my hair, and it was still like, maybe if you do something different, those things wouldn't happen to you. Even though I thought I was still, I did all the things. No drinking, no drugs, no sex before marriage. I was like, because those things didn't even calm to me anyways, right? My heart has always been to like, how can I help people? That's how it came out of my mama's womb, right? Yet, I find myself, downtown Corvallis, you must be a drug dealer. So someone called, I'm on a date, right, with my now husband, right? I would always explain those things away because for me, racism meant, again, it's only a few people who just are really out there and extreme. For the most part, we all get along because I didn't know about systemic racism. I didn't know about policies that were in place, redlining Portland's his, uh, Oregon's history of the black exclusion laws. I had no idea, no one ever told me that. And then I found out I'm not the only one who didn't know. So when Trayvon Martin, right? I mean, before that, I was even marching on CNN News with Oregon State University students, right? After Nita Hill's posters were plastered with the N-word, one of our friends was urinated on. That was 1996. But Angel was fighting, but Angel didn't understand the real fight. I didn't understand what we were really up against, y'all. Again, I just thought it was people. I didn't understand. There were actually laws that were holding us down that have been meant to keep us out. So when Trayvon Martin was murdered, I didn't understand. It all came together. I was hit. Everything started adding up. Everything that I explained away most of my life, I realized, oh my goodness. And I called my pastor and I said, you have to pray for us because it's not okay. This is not okay. And the black community is definitely not okay because I was on Facebook. How many of us are on Facebook? And if you have white and black Facebook friends, ha the white friends were talking about the football which I don't really care, right? It was like, other than, they didn't even know about Trayvon Martin. The black community was in anguish. And I felt torn because I said, how in the world are we living in two different Americas? But we're in the same place. They don't even know who Trayvon Martin is. I was rocked, and that's when I realized <laughs> systemic racism and how policies are super duper important. Policy change, policy work. Right? It changed my life. I mourned for about a year and a half. I literally mourned. And then I found NAACP, or NAACP found me. And the purpose of that, y'all, is to remember that we can't do this by ourselves. We can't change by ourselves. We need people around us and with us. 
right? So we have four, you had four speakers. I shouldn't say that, you've had more than that, but you've heard from Senator Fredrickson, or Fredericks, sorry, Senator. Senator Patterson, thank you so much for championing our bill. <laughs> you've also heard from Julianne Jackson, who is um, hoping to create, as you heard earlier, legislation as well, and myself, who is also a grassroots person. We are not, right? We are not legislators. We are community members advocating because we understand the importance of policy change and systemic change. Because I can change, which I did, I changed y'all, but guess what? If I go to the store and there's still these policies in place, I'm still kept out. If I go to school, which we, my kids do, and there's still these old policies, they're kept out. So I can change here, but we have to also change the rules, right? And so I don't think it's by coincidence that the four of us, who don't really know each other, by the way, we've like met briefly, that we are here today because we understand that policy is critical. And we, had, we are in the beginnings of our legislative short session, right? It's very short, it's about a month. And so they, they have, oh my gosh, amazing, as Senator Patterson said, some amazing um, justice and equity centered bills that are in the House and in the Senate right now. And I'm learning, because I always thought politics was really bad, right? Because when you see some politicians, it looks really bad, but I am starting to realize that you can't just, again, paint, you know, have a broad stroke of just painting things and stereotyping there are actually some really amazing heart, like leading with love legislators who really want to see systemic change in our state, in our country, right? So we get to join in in that work. So I want to, and when you say, what can I do? I need you to figure out what is going on in your, with your representative, with your senators, what bills are out there that you want to champion, you can write letters. Yes. You can actually speak at the hearings, in the committee hearings. You actually get to do, I had no idea this was possible, right? So when we talk about what we can do, it's not just we're gonna hold signs, those are good, have programs, this is great, but we want long-term systemic change all. And that comes in Salem. It's super important that we all get involved in that and use our voice to make changes. Okay? All right, so to end, I wanted to say the words one more time to the powerful black national anthem and just hear how many us's and ours because it's not just about one person. It's about all of us coming together. Lift every voice and sing every. Till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmony of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling seas. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won, right? It, said, it didn't say give up. It says let us march on till victory is won and that's what we're gonna do. What will your legacy be? Thank you so much. I did a poster testimony in uh, Independence City Park, the nine and a half minutes that a knee was put up upon a man's throat. And it, te uh, cardboard testimony, you don't say a word. You just have words written down and the people reading the words get to put in their own emotions and everything else. And during that period of time, I got to look at the faces of the people out there and people wanted to run. Facing inequality is hard. 
And sometimes we do want to run the other way. I like a good fight. Not, I've learned to phys at 14 years old, what was I doing? 75 fights a year, my brother and I figured it out. He and I went to school together and he was the younger one. He'd always say, my older brother will fight for you. And we figured it out at 75 fights a year. And I was really good at it. And then we moved to Chicago. Everything changed. I wasn't the only black kid there. Um, but then I came out here and I'm the only one. And I get to say that so many times and I don't like it. But I'm there. I go into the small communities. I took over a church in a really small community. And when I went over to that small community to take it over, everybody, every pastor in town said, don't. They won't like you. Good. Good. To every one of you here, speak up. Tell them. Tell them how beautiful a black person is. Tell them how wonderful it is to be around a black family, to go to a black celebration, to sing the black anthem. Learn the song. Whistle it. Make it something that you quote. But take the opportunity to make yourself uncomfortable, and in making yourself uncomfortable, you will make those around you uncomfortable until we're all uncomfortable and willing to make room for the next person. The 25th. Yes? A couple of announcements. Here she comes. Here she comes. You know what? So I am not, I do not like text. I do not like working. I don't know. I, I'm affiliated with five churches and everything else. And I get texts all the time. And so-and-so needs help. And so-and-so. And I'm involved with Celebrate Recovery. And I, all over the place. Carol, I look forward to hers. And they, you know, there's three or four. And they come at 10 o'clock at night. What are you doing up at 10 o'clock at night? So here's Carol. And give her a big one. So I've been asked to announce that there is a Black History Month display upstairs here in the Werner Center, so please take some time and take a look at it. We would also like you to know about the Monmouth Elementary School children's art display that are in these businesses. Uh, also Independence Elementary School has a couple of classes also. And here are the teachers. We had 13 teachers, Monmouth Elementary, and I think four at Independence Elementary. What we did is they took a black author or poet and did some artwork on it, and you'll find these on these businesses in Monmouth and Independence. So take a look at it. We also have 36 Black History Month flags in downtown Monmouth now. So thank you to the city. for putting that up, so, and um, we'll actually, um, and there's just one more thing here, some thank yous. If the Kayakis Band is still here, please, one more time for amazing music. So, What's your homework? <laughs> um, before you leave today, make a commitment to something. Um, one of the things uh, we mentioned, Angela Davis was mentioned. My dad uh, was involved with uh, Northwestern Graduate Political Sci uh, Dean of Graduate Studies, Northwestern University. We had a fancy dancy house on Lake Michigan. Uh, Jesse Jackson came to our house and he I mean, we had to, all, you kids go upstairs. And Jesse Jackson and his group was downstairs. Angela Davis came to the house and you kids go upstairs. We have stuff to talk about downstairs. And we had all these influential people, um, but I was such a rebellious young man that I didn't get to meet all these people. The, th the discussions I have with my dad now are amazing. Um, he's met and been a part of, but he also gives me homework. He's an educator. 
I'd ask my dad, how do you spell pneumonia? And he'd say, look it up. I don't know how to spell it. How do I look it up? That's my dad. So my dad gives me homework, and he's like, uh, so you live in Oregon. You're living in an all-white town. What are you doing? I go everywhere I can to make people uncomfortable. I'm that black guy. You cannot get around me. You cannot. I'm that guy. I wear T-shirts that are inappropriate because it's not the way you feel. I say things that are inappropriate because I think a little bit differently than you. And I stand in front of you every single day willing to accept whatever you throw. So what's your homework? What are you going to do? How can you change your neighborhood, your community? I'll close with a prayer. Father God, to each and every one of us, we have a place in our life that won't move unless you speak a word of truth to us. Words were spoken today that were true. Enlighten them, set them on fire. Let it cause us to be moved, but most of all, let it cause new growth, new life, new promise, and new alliances with people that we have set aside, have ignored, and haven't even acknowledged as being a part of us. We turn ourselves over to you that you might be glorified in the simple things that we do and then in the magnificent things that you will do. Help each and every one of us through this week, through this month, through this year, but most of all, help each and every one of us become better than we were when we walked in this door. And I pray that in Christ's name, amen.